this is um, an hour and a half, or just slightly less now because we've started slightly late, so I'm sorry about that, an hour and a half to discuss porn. Um, and sh sitting here, we had advertised that it would be Baroness Helena Kennedy. She sends her apologies. Something uh, very serious uh, happened to one of her students at her college in Oxford last night, on Friday night. Uh, somebody was hospitalized and the parents have flown in from America you know, the rest of the story will unfold. But she really felt that she had to uh, have duty of care there, and she sends her good wishes and apologies. Um, I'm just going to ask if you could just move your chair just slightly that way so that... Can you see now? OK. Um, and um, so the, 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 the format... The format is that um, we're going to hear from uh, Beban Kidron for uh, a, a talk and then we're going to discuss together as a panel some of the issues that we raises, and then it's going to be over to you to discuss it in detail. Let me tell you uh, a little bit about the history of, of our two experts. Um, so, Beban Kidron was, has spent the last 30 years working as a feature film and television drama and documentary maker. Uh, she's both a director and a producer. She's the co-founder of Film Club, which is an educational charity that uses films to educate young people. And this has grown to be one of the largest youth engagement programs in the UK. And her films include Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit, Bridget Jones, Edge of Reason, Sex, Death and the Gods, and In Real Life, amongst many others. She's a trustee of the Paul Hamlin Foundation, and um, she's a, a film council member of the Institute of Contemporary Arts, a patron of the law, Action Worldwide, and president of Voluntary Arts. And she sits in the House of Lords as a crossbench peer. So she's really called Baroness Kidron of Angel, <laughs> OBE. Yes, so she's going to show us her wings. Right, right. Uh, and then on my right-hand side is Paula Hall. She's a psychotherapist, a writer, and a broadcaster who specialises in sex and pornographic, pornographic addiction. And she creates treatments for people who want to overcome their compulsive behaviour, uh, and as well as giving support and advice for partners. Uh, she's current chair of the Association for the Treatment of Sex Addiction and Compulsivity, and she develops training for professionals, as well as providing expert advice, you know, to to anybody who needs it professionally and, and for public bodies too. And she's author of Understanding and Treating Sex Addiction and published in many academic journals. Um, she, the documentary Porn on the Brain was something that she most recently contributed to, and we'll probably talk about that. I should say, as I would in any of the sessions that we have, uh, whether they be about rape, whether they be about abuse, whether they be about violence, that if things that happen in the room today uh, strike you on a personal level as something that you want to explore further, then we, we have um, uh, counsellors available and you mustn't be afraid to acknowledge something that you need to discuss and then come and find someone to discuss it. Uh, because, you know, this can be a, it can happen as a surprise. You can suddenly go, oh my God, I remember, or I've realized, or I've been in denial, or this is something I need to think more about. You know, whatever it is, this is a safe space for us to discuss dangerous things, and we're all the same animal in the end. So that's the thing I wanted to say. But I'm going to hand over now. Uh, so Beban is going to, um, to talk, and, uh, and then we'll discuss what she talks about. Thank you, Beban. Brilliant. Hello. Um, well, I don't know whether anyone else in the room was struck when I was being introduced that clearly I am not an expert on this subject. There was nothing in that bio that made me an expert on pornography. Um, but that isn't going to shut me up, surprisingly. Um, and, and I do want to just say something about WOW and this weekend and this week, that it has been a theme of the things that I've attended, uh, that actually breaking the silence and just talking is part of the cure. So I'm there in that spirit. I'm here in that spirit. And um, Jude referred to a film that I've just made. It's a film, it's called uh, In Real Life, and it is about the internet and teenagers. And that's really why I'm here, because one of the issues that um, um, teenagers have with the internet is pornography. So Forgive me, because I'm going to read some of my remarks rather than just speak off the cuff, uh, because I think this is a very difficult subject, and I come at it in a few different ways. I come at it as a mother, I came at it as a filmmaker, I come at it as a woman and as a feminist, and each one of those things lends a colour to what I think about it, and I decided that actually it was complicated, and I wanted to be sure of what I was saying. 
I'm going to start with talking about a recent meeting uh, that I had with um, some young boys. And, and I should probably preface my remarks by saying that since I made the film, I am very in demand uh, at schools and universities. I visit a school or university probably either every week or every other week at the moment. I have hundreds who are waiting for my attention. And one of the things that children want to talk about, young people want to talk about, is sex and pornography. Um, so in that, uh, in that world that I now occupy, I find myself in the room with a group of 15-year-old boys. And it's quite a long and uh, convoluted conversation. And eventually, I ask the very obvious question, uh, when you imagine ejaculating, where do you imagine ejaculating? And they were quite shocked that I might, someone of my age might ask this question. But they went, well, miss, in the face. And I went, oh, OK, anywhere else? And they go, yeah, on the tits. Yes, on the tits, miss, up the arse, miss, in the mouth, miss. Yeah? Now, I did find the correlation between the word miss and these particular things and these boys ejaculating <laughs> a little confusing. But let's just say it took a lot of nudging and a lot of conversation to get to anything that might resemble a vagina or perhaps more importantly for our conversation, because I am not here to valorize one kind of sex over another kind of sex, to actually anything that suggested the participation of a young woman in this activity, apart from as a receptacle or as target practice. Now, that is, you know, that is one group of boys. It's anecdotal evidence. I understand the problems with anecdotal evidence, but I would have to say the uh, collective anecdotal evidence of my current life in schools and universities and amongst young people suggests to me, as do the statistics, that this is a direction of travel. Um, that the NSPCC found recently that a third of all 11 to 18 year olds believe pornography dictates how they should behave in a relationship. A third. I think that's a lot. In my school visits, I go out of my way to establish that I'm not so much bothered about pornography itself as I am about pornography as an instruction manual. I whip out a dictionary, and I look up definitions of sex, and I look up definitions of pornography, and we have a grand old time trying to work out what the gap is. And what we normally conclude between them and me, we, we, I try and help them conclude, put it that way, um, that by learning, trying to learn the A to Z of sex from pornography is actually like learning the, you know, part of the alphabet. You know, pornography is sort of X to Z, and they might be missing out A to W. And actually, they like that way of thinking about it, and they all laugh, and then they all suddenly look a little bit shocked because they realize A to W is quite a big gap, and they are wondering where the hell they're going to find out that bit. Yeah, And I think that that's a theme of what I really want to say here, is there's a big gap, and pornography is, is over here for young people. So I would say, as a mother, you know, I am concerned about a generation of young people growing up with a very narrow and distorted view of sex. And I'm particularly worried, as the mother of both a boy and a girl, that that view is not gender neutral. So I myself am of the post-pill generation, and, and I feel that women who are a little older than me had already defined, redefined sex and sexuality for my generation. There were questions of mutuality, female desire, the separation of sex from reproduction. All that work was in the public arena. All that work was in public discourse as I grew up. And I was very much the beneficiary of that. It was clear to me from a multiplicity of sources that sex was a nuanced thing, it was a complex thing, and as well as being a personal thing, that it encompassed familial and gender power relationships, as well as providing the next generation. And I tried to find a word on the bus this morning. I scribbled. You can see it here. I've got 
frustrating, bewildering, infuriating, galling, fucking maddening, all of this. So, but what I had here first was, so I find it disappointing, that's my public persona, that in our new world, where all information is easily available at the stroke of a smartphone, that the representations of sex and sexuality are so entirely dominated by commercially driven adult male fantasy. Yeah? The vast majority of pornography, and I have to say for reasons beyond my control, I've seen an unbelievable amount, an unenviable amount of pornography, um, reduces sex, which is something that I see as intrinsically complex, intimate, individual, human, and encompasses so many different qualities, is performed as an impersonal spectacle that fetishizes certain acts and certain images again and again. And I do have in my head now my 15-year-old boys. Our prudish world that denies young people access to age-appropriate, high-quality sex education gives free reign to a fantastical version of sex predicated on male dominance involving the explicit and implicit debasing of women that speaks more to the question of power than sex. Mainstream heterosexual pornography, gendered, monotone, pervasive, has colonized the space given to representation of sex in visual media. And in its wake, it promotes unreal unrealistic expectations of women's bodies, creating pressure to conform, big boobs, bronze bodies, no hair. And it depresses me that half of 11 to 16 year olds shave or wax their bikini line, and that 40% of that age group, 11 to 16, wear a padded bra, and one in three have a spray tan which is offensive just because of the smell. Now, as a woman, it concerns me that pornography does not deal with the ordinary, the tentative, the complicated, or the hairy. Now, in feminism, you know, there are two views, and I'm going to actually, I'm sure it will come up, and I'm going to skip over it because I want an easy life. But I do want to <laughs> talk about the por por pornification of public space. What was once, even in my lifetime, and I'm, I'm old, but I'm not that old, um, you know, what was softcore porn is advertising. And I was interested in yesterday's debate, you know, about page three, you know, and I kind of go to myself, why the hell are we going to bother banning page three if every day on the way to school, the M and S ad is a woman in knickers, you know? I find that quite extraordinary, and young women growing around that expectation, I think, is very problematic. The sexualization of everything is the new norm, and I think it's important to remember this because it creates a new starting place for pornography. Pornography, in order to do its job of transgressing current norms, has to then start somewhere else. It has to start harder and go further. In a world where women are still negotiating the nature and the basis of their equal participation in public and private life, the routine sexualized humiliation of women represented both in pornography and the broader pornification of images of women in public life is a weapon against our empowerment. It is not a symbol of our liberation. As a feminist, I feel that we inherited something precious and hard won from our mothers and we are bequeathing something rather ugly to our daughters. Now, on school visits, both boys and girls speak freely, anxiously, 
about body pressure, about sexual pressure, and about the performance pressure that they feel. And I have to say, I was very moved on Friday when I did several talks in schools as my own personal celebration of Women's Day. Um, and 160 girls got to their feet to applaud not me, but their classmate, who shouted out from the back and said, this is fantastic, miss, but why the hell weren't you here three years ago before it all went wrong? Yeah? I felt heartbroken, and I did rather wonder where I had been three years ago. Not there, sadly. These young people may not talk like this, but what they know is that unholy alliance that unifies free marketeers and free speeches, combined with a lack of public space in which sex is discussed in a more sophisticated and uninflicted way, ultimately leaves them learning sex from the pornographer's handbook. We need spaces where young can avail themselves of more neutral or individual images and information. We need to debunk the notion prevalent in pornography that resistance can be a form of foreplay. We need to reestablish a public conversation around consent, mutuality, and sexual difference. They need to know that vulnerability and sensitivity of both boys and girls is a natural part of the whole. They want to talk about friendship and family as well as sex. And they want to talk about cultural norms and where their desires fit into that picture. And we need to prioritize age-appropriate, high-quality sex and relationship education in our schools. As a woman, as a mother, as a feminist, I find myself uncomfortably on the side of the morally outraged. But if the price of freedom is a generation of young people who think that spraying cum in a girl's face is first base, then I am prepared to redefine the word freedom. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, the first time we started WOW, which was four years ago now, uh, the first debate, I, I, one of the debates I wanted to have, I, th I think I called it, was Mary Whitehouse right? And it, and it was a deliberately contentious title. I, we might not have ended up calling it that, but because I mean, I grew up remembering Mary Whitehouse as being an absolutely puritanical sort of figure who wanted to ban things, and she seemed to want to ban everything I enjoyed, which was <laughs> including Top of the Pops. Um, <laughs> but like uh, Bevan, I have both as a parent, and Billy, just as a person, uh, begun to really study my sort of extended liberal uh, kind of credentials around inactivity in the face of an instinctive sense that stuff was happening that didn't feel right. Uh, and I, you know, we'll come on to the issue of freedom, perhaps. But the, the interesting thing is that we have had many examples in the world where people sort of go, we all knew it was happening, but we didn't like to talk about it. Now, I am in no way, so please don't get me wrong, suggesting that anything like the genocide in the Congo or what is happening, what happened in Germany, or you know, there are other examples when you go, we all knew it was happening, but we didn't really say anything. And one of the questions I have is whether this epidemic of sexual normality, having had the goalpost moved so far, is something where we all know this has happened, but we're not saying anything. And and really, I'm going to turn to you at this point. Um, Paula, because you do a lot of work on addiction and the trigger mechanisms that form, f f form addiction and then the, and how addiction then gets embedded and normalized. So I wondered whether you'd just like to respond to what we've just heard. 
I think, as Beban said, to start off with, pornography is such a massively complex issue, and we could talk about it all day. Um, I suppose what I see in, in my work is the, the consequences of the compulsive use of addiction, and I think the, often what's causing the, the hardcore porn that is becoming increasingly normalised is, is escalation. And from an addiction point of view, we talk about that in terms of escalation. And the more something becomes normalised, the more our brains become sensitised to it. We, it just becomes the norm, and actually we're no longer shocked. We don't have the same brain responses. It just doesn't shock us anymore. So if you want something a little bit more exciting, a bit more risque, the, the levels go up and up and up. Um, there, there's no doubt that uh, pornography addiction, I'm very aware calling it addiction is quite controversial, um, and as yet there is not clinical evidence to prove it's an addiction in the same way as other addictions. But you mentioned about using anecdotal evidence. The anecdotal evidence is overwhelming. There are currently forums around the world for young men who are struggling with erectile dysfunction caused by watching pornography, and there are about 140,000 people on those forums trying to give up porn so that they can get back their, their natural sexual functioning and find their natural libido. And what I very much believe is, is a crime currently in society is that there's no warnings on the bottle. We are in a position where we end up talking about being pro-porn or being anti-porn, rather than recognising actually there are many different genres of porn, and one person's pornography might be another person's art, might be another person's education, may be hardcore to one person, may simply be a diverse taste to somebody else. There are many different genres of porn. And for me, it is very much about sex and relationship education. I don't believe that all sex has to be partnered sex and has to be cosy and include cushions and whatever else. There are many different varieties of sex, and it's up to the individual to decide how they want to express their sexuality. But there needs to be education around pornography. We need to be able to talk about the risks. Another bit I'd like to add is I, I am working predominantly with men and with young boys affected by pornography. And I, I do very much agree with many of the feminist debates, but also what I want to highlight is actually male porn stars always perform. They have no emotions about what they do. They are generally completely dissociated from anything that may be going on in their hearts and souls around the act. They don't get paid for that. Uh, they always have rock-hard erections that go on for hours and hours and hours, and they can ejaculate exactly when they're told to, on cue, wherever they're told to do it. This also puts a huge pressure on male sexuality. So pornography is also creating the norms for male sexuality. And exactly as Bevan said, what, what happens to the, the A to W, that's not being taught, that's not being learnt. And actually that is, that is a real crime against young men. And many of them don't realise that they have got the, the problems they've had in, with porn until they try to get into a partnered relationship and then find actually they might like something more sensitive themselves. They might like to make love, but actually, the equipment doesn't work anymore. And it doesn't work because what's happened in the brain is that threshold has become so high. Now, there's no education out there. There was no warning. So they think, oh, well, maybe that's not how it's meant to be. Yeah, maybe if I just come on her tits, oh, that seemed to work. Good. Maybe that's how it's meant to be then. It's the lack of education that I think is, is a real issue that we've, we should have been addressing years ago, as you say, but we have absolutely got to start doing it now. Uh, can I ask you... When you, well, both of you will have this experience of uh, talking to government and public bodies. We'll start with you. You are talking to people about this danger territory, the rising level of young people, but also people in all parts of their life who suddenly discover that addiction to pornography is changing their sense of self, it, destroying their partnerships, you know, potential partnerships and, and, and current partnerships. Uh, but with no health warnings. Yeah. So what is the response of government and health agencies? You know, what are you finding people are saying? <laughs> what people tend to say is something along the lines of, so you're Mary Whitehouse and you want to ban porn then. It instantly goes into a pro or anti-porn debate rather than talking about the potential consequences. Um, 
I mean, and I, I think we don't, we don't recognise the severity of the consequences. Um, I, I have an ongoing survey that's happening online. There's about um, 3,000 respondents to that now. And 38% said that their pornography issues started under the age of 16. These are now many of them are men in their 30s, 40s, 50s, but the problem started under the age of 16. Why do we have to wait until then to start talking about what's happening to adolescents now? And one in five of my clients have been actively suicidal. I mean, act properly, actively suicidal because of the consequences of what has happened. And it's still, frankly, not taken seriously. Or it becomes a debate of, ah, but do you know if it actually is addiction? Because it's not in DSM yet. I don't know if it is an actual addiction, but it certainly is a bloody big problem. And that's what we need to be addressing. But, but the programme that was made by Michael Dobney, actually, Martin Dobney, rather, about online addiction and porn, um, was very convincing. I mean, I don't know whether you know, he's, some of you would have seen him speak yesterday in the page three debate. We'll come back to that later. But he was the editor of Loaded. He f got frightened, really, by the impact he realized he was, or the culture to which he was contributing. And when he had a son and he's just had a daughter, he suddenly thought, actually, I've got to rethink all of this. So he made a Channel 4 series, and in it, they, they were able to take brain scans and demonstrate that exactly the same gratification buttons as alcohol, uh, drugs, uh, gambling were being pressed. But the, there, there is a real political issue here as well in terms of money. Um, if anybody's thought about what the impact would be on global economies if you ban porn, um, uh, Romania, I don't know what would happen to their economic situation if you took webcams away and stopped having pulls. A huge amount of it comes from there. So when you, it becomes a very, very political debate when you start talking about whether or not you're going to ban porn, whether or not you're going to put filters on. Um, and, and yes, it is undoubtedly a growing issue, but actually it becomes so complex and people will keep on going into, well, you, so are you saying you need to ban it? And I think undoubtedly we need more research, but who's going to pay for that? Um, there are people who will pay for research into alcohol issues, into drug issues, because it costs our economy in healthcare a huge amount of money. Currently, porn addiction is the, the silent killer, if you like. It's not really costing our economy any money. So who's going to bother to finance it? So, yeah, the, the, the uh, Cambridge research that was done, which was, was demonstrating that the same cue response happens in the brain with pornography addiction as with cocaine addiction, was a very small study funded by a television production company mostly, which means, regrettably, academically, it, it gets brought into dispute. It becomes about funding. Right. Uh, Bevan, you used the word freedom at the end. You know, you kind of, you, uh, you, 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 it was sort of, you went there. Um, but, but do you actually mean you would be prepared to consider censorship? Uh, no, actually. I, d I, oh. I suspect you didn't. Yeah. Um, you know, oh, I think we've got some very complicated issues about, about one person's freedom being another person's oppression, and that is always something. But actually, with respect to porn, my own personal view is that it should be, we should do a lot more uh, opting in than opting out and, and not worry about banning so much. I would be very keen to see adult content. When you go, go into it, say, this is adult content, do you want to watch it? And actually, those kids who don't want to watch it, then they can go, oh, no, actually, I didn't. That was, that was not where I was heading. But actually, those that do want to watch it, and are transgressing, let them know that that is transgressing. Part of the issue here is about what is considered normal, what the adult world is telling you is normal. So, so I think that, that most of my emphasis is also on education, and I would like to say this, which is we, we recently um, had an amendment to the Children's Bill in the House of Lords about making SRE, sex and relationship education, compulsory in all schools, not just, um, uh, you know, including free schools, et cetera, et cetera. I would actually extend that to independent schools myself, but that I could not get the support for. Uh, and we lost. And I think that that is an absolute crime against the next generation. I really do. And I would say anyone in this room who has the privilege of a vote should not vote for anybody, anybody in 2015 who is not prepared to put their name to compulsory sex and relationship education in schools.
Right. <laughs> I, I also agree that actually censorship um, is, is not necessarily going to be appropriate, but also I think potentially it can give us full sense of security. Um, the idea of opt-in, opt-out, I also completely agree it should be um, a, about opting in, but you speak to any young person about if they know how to get around a, a filter or a blocker, they can do it in seconds. If you happen to know what a Dutch is for breasts, you're in in 99% of them, unless you're in Holland, of course, um, is if you can do it in a different language. The other problem with just doing that is you go into the proxy servers. And those of you who know a bit about the internet, and I don't know masses, proxy servers really are the dark side of the internet now. And if you only rely on blocking, what you'll be doing is young people who generally know a hell of a lot more about technology than we do, will go onto the proxy service where not only are they seeing hardcore porn, but they can also get access to the beheading, to the political rights sort of movement, all, all the really, really, really dark stuff. So I am for censorship at some levels, but we mustn't get lulled into a full sense of security on that. That would be really damaging. Uh, uh, can I yeah, one little thing to that, which is I'm really concerned that in the public discourse that this idea of child ex sexual exploitation and pornography often gets conflated. And I think that's something else that we have to be aware of. What is truly illegal and truly exploited, you know, exploiting online should be dealt with by the law and they should put a lot more resources into that. That is a completely separate issue from pornography, which is a standalone problem and it's easy for those that lead us to, to look like they're doing something if it's conflated. So I think that, that we also have a responsibility to understand, you know, and to talk about these things and have a multiplicity of approaches, not just one. And that's why blocking is so, you know, I mean, A, it doesn't work, and B, it, uh, you know, it, it, it's singular. What we need is a much more sophisticated approach to this. Okay, I, I just wanted to ask you one more question because you did actually say that you would be supportive of censorship. Could, could you define? Because, I, because the, the, the whole territory gets so muddy, finally, around the idea of, well, what are we going to do? Is it banning? Again, I think it, you, you have to bear in mind that there are so many different genres of pornography and there is no doubt that there is some pornography um, that obviously is, is hurting children, it is against the law, um, it is coercive, it is dangerous. So there are some hardcore type pornography that I think actually should be censored but, but and we should be looking at... And legally, that has been agreed and that will get banned. It, it might be hard if, to do it, but, yes, but legally. Yes, yeah, that's yeah. what I was talking about, really, in terms of censorship. But I think we have to stop talking just about pornography in the singular, assuming that when we say porn is good, porn is bad, porn this, porn that, there is such a massive variety out there. And for many people, as you say, it's, it's, it's actually, um, it is a place of freedom for, the, for them. It's liberating. There are lots of people, single people, people who don't have the opportunity to have partnered sex, that the internet has, has just been amazing for. It's a really rich source of sexual education. It, it can be fantastic. So I think censorship would be such a clumsy tool that could potentially do far, far too much harm, but some stuff, yeah. It's got to all, be all right, well, well I mean, shall we, for the purposes of this, agree that um, there's quite a lot of people who could enjoy pornography at a certain level and they should be happy to do that and so on? I mean, is that something that you both subscribe to? That, or are you actually saying that y you kind of wish pornography didn't exist at all at any level? I can't, I can't wish uh, uh, that it doesn't. I, I have a very, no, no, I think people want to watch porn, let them watch porn, yeah? Uh, I think the fact that it is so pervasive and we have somehow, it's like, um, it's like globalizer, it's like, it's like the single image of sexuality that has colonized our sexual conversation. That I hate. And so my fight is to get the other up there, yeah? That's my fight. Okay, well, let's just focus, before we you know, come back on to the, the, the issues of uh, hardcore porn and all the implications of that, can we just talk about sex and relationship um, education for a minute? Because this is something you can do, 
And as you know, I am very keen that at WOW, we hear about stuff and then we do things. Um, I was, like you, very shocked that it was blocked at ministerial level, which it was. You know, schools could and must be doing education, not just biology, but relationship education. And can you just explain why you think it got blocked? Who blocked it? Well, <laughs> can we just name that? Yeah. That? Um, <laughs> well, Michael Gove, we know, does uh, not believe in central control unless it's his. Um, I think, I think there's a, you know, that what was really disappointing uh, in the House of Lords specifically was that there was this incredible moment where I realized that they had divided the House between PHSC supporters and SRE supporters. And I literally sat there on the red benches, and forgive me, I'm relatively new in that position, and I should have just stood up and said this, but I, I sat there and I thought, it's like asking people to choose between their children you know, PHSE, the wider health of children, or sex and relationship, and, and they sort of divided the support in the house. I think that the bottom line is that it's seen as liberal, it's seen as invasive, and I think we have to say out loud that the church does not want it. And one of the arguments that I get from ministers when I talk about them, they go, yes, we know, we know, we know, you know more than we know, and we know, but, it's up to parents. And I say we've got a double-headed monster here, and one of it is the smartphone, which is any parent knows that they are with their child one or two or three hours a day, and their smartphone is with them 24 hours a day. And we don't have the possibility of monitoring, nor should we probably, but we don't have the possibility even of monitoring our children. And the other thing is, and that's, uh, and this is something that so many uh, kids have said to me, kids don't want to speak to their parents about sex. They might want to speak about many, many things, but actually they like talking about it in a slightly less personalized space. They like talking about it with peers there so that they can sort of inch their way into it. And they like talking about it with strangers, preferably ones that go away <laughs> afterwards but so you're not a permanent, you know, Mr. Roberts knowing about their question. You know, so I think that there are ways to approach it. They're really obvious things to do. And I am actually involved in one you know, one initiative that will see uh, young people designing their own sex and relationship education uh, curriculum that we will then try and promote into schools. Right. So I, I like to be efficient. Uh, even if you don't believe that pornography is a problem or you don't want anything done about anything at all, the idea of sex and relationship training for young people is in an intelligent thing to offer. And you can't ask parents to be responsible entirely for all aspects to do with ch children's growing up. If that was the case, actually, a lot of children, sadly, wouldn't be going to school. I mean, it, it became compulsory to send your child to school. So uh, can I suggest that at WOW, you find out how to lobby Parliament about sex and relationship education on the curriculum and send in your emails, send in your letters, send in your tweets. You know, you are a force to be reckoned with. Uh, how many people have done that on sex and relationship training so far? Right, that's about nine. How many people are going to do it? Okay, that's fine. So, please do. I can do it to both Houses of Parliament, to all ministers, and to their special advisers. Okay, so, <laughs> so that's that done. Um, the, 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 but l can we return to the idea of um, the, the, the moving of the goalposts, which is really what you're saying, that we, society has created a new, a new norm about sexualization forcing pornography, if you like, to take another step to, uh, to, to a, a far-flung space in order to really be extreme, much more extreme. Um, do you think we can pull it back again? Is that, are there examples of societies culturally shifting, not through law, but through attitude? Well, I don't... I can't speak to wider societies, but I would say that I do feel there are some younger women 
who are beginning to say no, yeah? This is not how we want to be seen. This is not appropriate for our self-image. We want a more complex public face than the one that is currently being delivered commercially. And I think you have to keep on, you have to keep in mind the fact that the drivers here are all commercial. And, and I think we have to believe that, otherwise we give up. And I do just want to come back on one little thing that you say. You say there's nothing we can do, there's no intervention and so on. And I actually don't feel that. I, I actually do think there's an awful lot we can do around compulsion loops. There's an awful lot we can do around the way in which people are using the internet. There's an awful lot we can do about how young people see it as a creative place rather than a consuming place. And there's all sorts of things that, that you know, it's a very complex system, but there's all sorts of things that added together would add up to an empowerment of young people in that space that might make this one little part of a, pro of a much bigger, healthier um, space for them. And, and, and I think that, that it is very difficult to say that there's banning or nothing, but I think that we can do quite a lot of things in that gray area. Mm -hmm. I, I, sorry, go on. Yeah, I just want to I, I completely agree with you, but I, I would really like to think about how we can create a space for young men's voices mm -hmm as well. The assumption that all young men are absolutely loving this stuff and getting on, no. off on this stuff is just not right. But actually, if you're a young guy and you're not into that, that's actually quite hard to say. If you actually think, ugh, that's gross, I wouldn't want to do that, then what does that make you as a young man? I think there are so many messages out there to young men about this is how you're meant to perform sexually and you're meant to be okay about it. So yeah, it's great that more young women are standing up and saying, no, but actually I'd like some forums where young men can stand up and say no as well, without being a wuss. Yes. Yeah, because actually the, the, the pressure, the, the, the damage, if people acknowledge there is damage, if there is damage, it's happening in both parties. Absolutely. Mm. And, and I think that it is interesting if you took smoking as an example, that, um, you know, the imagery around smoking was that it was very cool. It was very cool. You were the Marlboro cowboy or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And only gradually when they showed pictures of what was happening into the lungs did people say, well, actually, this is self-harming. And it, so that's, that's moved, uh, you know, in the last 40 years in an incredible way. And I think it's obviously the assumption about pornography, hard hardcore and vindictive pornography, is that it harms the woman. But you're really saying, actually, that's naive. It's, it's self-harming as well. And I think also a lot of our discourse at the moment is around, is around shame. When we're talking about whether or not pornography is OK or not OK, we talk about shame. And what that, again, what that can do to young guys, particularly if they are enjoying it at some level, and I think you know, pleasure's a complex thing, um, it can leave them feeling shame and make it hard for them to speak out about it. But I think when we start more of a health-based discourse and actually helping young men to recognize that actually this changes your brain this the changes that the tolerance that you're developing is actually not about taste and arousal it's about dopamine changes in your brain then again that is going to give them a voice to say actually i would like to control how my brain is changing and not having it controlled by this this external stimuli so get away from just a, a shame-based discourse about pornography and start talking about health and choice. Right, it's, it's funny because when I'm in schools and I'm talking about compulsion loops, I don't use the word addiction, but the compulsion loops that they experience, you know, that, that sort of feeling that I must check the likes, you know, that, that feeling that, that, that my phone might be talking to me and I don't know. Um, and, and actually, when I explain to them the technology behind... Uh, some of those compulsion loops and some of those feelings, and I occasionally accuse them of being lab rats for Google, they actually get quite a kind of a strident position on that, and they come afterwards, and after we spoke, and I teach them how to deactivate all their buzzes and alerts in their phones, because 85% of us never do do that, and young people don't know how to do that. And, and I think that it does play into their relationship, you know, of, of compulsion that is already 
that's already established. And if you're looking for sex, why wouldn't you look for sex if you're young? And that's the sex that's available. And I think it's that thing of broadening the places where sex is a conversation. Yeah, and I do agree with you about the, the boy thing. And I just wanted to say there's a, uh, a boy who talks very openly about porn in the film that I made. And I often show the clip. And then I talk to the kids about what he said after he saw it and his struggle to have a relationship with a girl. And the entire group, when I say, and he did eventually find a girlfriend. And he said that his desire was to make her happy in the relationship. Boys and girls alike, they all go, oh. <laughs> you know, it's a sort of a glorious moment of understanding what they desire and putting their desires back on the map. OK, so we're going to hand over to the house, as it were, for questions and comments. I, I hope you understand that nobody is suggesting that people here are not allowed to enjoy porn, if you do. I mean, seriously. Uh, and that eroticism and the spectrum of eroticism through to any kind of version of uh, investigation sexually is yours for the having. Uh, but so this really is a debate actually about the, the kind of cultural norm that we've arrived at and the implications of that and whether or not we are damaging our society, particularly our, our young people, or you know, maybe you think we're not.